Hello, welcome to our today's class where we are going to talk about atelectasis, a state where our lungs collapse because of different causes. Start with the introduction. By definition, atelectasis is actually the deflation or inadequate inflation of the airways. And in this case, we are being specific, that is the alveoli, leading to it either developing partial or complete lung collapse. So there are status where we find our airways or the alveoli can end up having inadequate inflation or does not get enough air into them and as a result they collapse and in the long run the lung also can end up collapsing. So what happened is atelectasis operates in such a way that it will make our respiratory system to have inadequate gaseous exchange hence arise in what we call ventilation, perfusion imbalance and hypoxia. So what do we mean by this um, ventilation perfusion issues? What this shows, you find that when we have uh, breathing in and breathing out, we know that from our environment, we breathe in oxygen and carbon dioxide, but at different percentages. And during this process, we expect that uh, oxygen in this case will be absorbed to the blood system. And in this case, being absorbed by the deoxygenated blood, and then carbon dioxide will flow outside so that you can breathe it out. Now, when this happens, this is how we are handling gaseous exchange and bringing in oxygen supply to our system. But now, during atelectasis, what happens is the alveoli is not inflated the way we are seeing it here on our photo. Instead, our alveoli has collapsed. So it's no longer inflating or it's not becoming enlarged to accommodate this air. So as a result, we don't get enough air in this space. So we can have comprehensive, obstructive, and contraction atelectasis. We'll discuss each one by one. So let's start with compre I mean compressive atelectasis. Compressive atelectasis occurs when air or fluid in the pleural cavity is under increased pressure such that it starts to push against our lung tissue or against our walls on the lungs and causing the alveoles and small airways to collapse. What can push or can press against it could be either tumors, airs like in the case of pneumothorax and in some cases blood that has clot. So in this case let's evaluate in our diagram here or in our photo and in this case you find that in this client um, in this client we have we have blood that is here or could be air or sometimes could be fluid. Now this amount of substance here, when it keeps filling in and becoming huge and increasing in amount and so on, it will start to push against our lung tissue. Now when it keeps pushing against our lung tissue, remember our lung tissue can only expand when air goes in adequately. But when we keep pushing against it, it means it will have to force those airways or the, in this case the alveolus around that area to collapse because when the pressure is too high, the inner part of the lung has low pressure in that state. So now they tend to collapse the airways inside there. Obstructive or obstructive, it's a very interesting one because here we are having air moving into our bloodstream, but there's no any air to coming in to replace it. So we said we go through breathing in and breathing out. When we breathe in, we take in air. And we said when we take in this air, the air will go into our different uh, alveoli and then it will go through the gaseous exchange, get absorbed into and carbon dioxide gets out. But now in resorptive, there is a problem happening such that the air that is already in our alveoli gets to be absorbed correctly. But now there's no any other air to enter in that space. Now, if there's no any other air to enter in that space, what happens is this alveolar is at risk of collapsing. So what uh, this resorptive atelectasis is stating is that the oxygen or the air in our space moves into the bloodstream and then there's no new air to go in. 
What can make this state happen? It can be due to anesthesia, mucus, or sometimes tumor. Anesthesia, how does it cause all this? It, because when someone is under the anesthetic drugs, some of these drugs have a side effect of actually causing a state we call respiratory depression, or a state where our patient will not have the normal breathing pattern. So because of this anesthetic effect, they are not able to breathe as adequately as possible. So they are taking in very little amount of air and some of it gets absorbed and there's no any other to go in. Well, in the case of mucus, mucus sometimes tends to accumulate in these states, in these spaces. And so whatever was already there gets absorbed and so there's no any other new air to go in there. And tumors apparent the same with mucus. Accumulates in our, in our air spaces covers the whole of that air space and the air that is already existing there gets absorbed and we don't have any other to go in again. So resorptive or obstructive simply means whatever is already on the system gets absorbed and then we don't have any other that can replace the absorbed air. So as a result, our alveoli remains empty and is at risk of collapsing. Contraction, which is the last one, contraction or what you call cicatrization, not electasis. What this means, it simply means a scar or a healing tissue that is making the lung to fail, to expand. Uh, the best way to have this well understood is when you have a wound and in that wound area heals, we leave a scar. The scar area, most of the time you will discover it is less elastic as opposed to your skin area that is the tone is still uh, complete there's no injury there has never occurred and on so when you have a scar on our lung tissue the effect is the same the area where the lung scar exists it is less elastic so what happens is when we breathe in we are not able to expand our lung tissues as adequately as possible the lung scar is also called fibrosis so now when this scar exists, let's say this lung got some injuries or there was a disease like pleurisy and it brought out scars as a result, then you can find a state whereby when we breathe in, we don't take in enough air. And the enough air, I mean the air that has been breathed in, once it is absorbed, then you can have an issue where there's inadequate air and the alveolus can collapse. But also you need to put in mind, because this scar is already non-elastic or it's not elastic enough in this case it makes our airways to become at risk of not taking in enough air so as a result these lungs are also at risk of collapsing on the long run so that's what contraction at electasis means the scars are making our lung tissues to be less elastic so it's not expanding adequately to take in enough air so for instance what we are seeing here there are several scars that have healed and they're making this tissue to be very fibrotic because this is a summary but if you've been following the cause the types then you will see already we've mentioned some of the causes so i will just highlight them because we've explained them already so you can have fluids and the fluids can be instead of pleural effusion mucus plugs the close aspiration of object or external object that can go block our airways and make air uh, escape so that you don't have any other extra to come in. Pain. Pain, most of the time here we are referring to chest pain. So in case someone has a chest wound pain due to either surgical procedures or any other process that could be happening in the chest, then you find this patient does not have a good or a stable uh, breathing pattern. So as a result, they have what we call shallow breath. Now, the effects of having shallow breath means you don't take enough air capacity or enough air volume. So the little you take in can either get resorbed or being absorbed in the system and then you remain with no air in the alveoli, meaning they can easily collapse. So that's how pain brings, us, brings out this, uh, this issue. And then we have the prolonged superimposition. Now, superimposition, you need to understand that this is a position where the client is settled at 180 angle in relation to the ground. So in this case, in superimposition, it's one of the positions that is known to reduce our chest cavity. So as a result, we don't have enough cavity to take in as maximum lung volume as possible. So because we take in little, then that little can also risk us into developing atelectasis. Increase in abdominal pressure, for instance, organomegaly. 
Organs uh, nearing our respiratory system includes things like the stomach, the spleen, the liver, which is the nearest of all. So when you have organomegaly, where let's say the liver is expanding, when this liver has enlarged, it may end up pushing against our respiratory organs. And when they do that, they are reducing the, the thoracic cavity or they are reducing the thoracic space. So when we breathe in, we also don't, have, we don't end up with enough air. So you can start developing any of these types of, of, of atelectasis. And then reduced lung volume, and in this case due to different reasons, musculoskeletal, neural disorders, and so on. Then you can have surgery. This is more of a trauma into this into into the air into the lung tissues which can be relinked to the side effects of having inadequate breathing pattern or issues of low lung capacities so as a result we may end up with the telectasis tumors and also fibrosis or lung scarring so what are the signs and symptoms or clinical manifestation that can show in a patient who have a telectasis? So remember, for you to understand clinical manifestation, it's best first to know what caused it, how is it developing with time, and what are the possible complications that a telectasis can lead to. So in this case, a patient who is presenting with sputum production, other existing illnesses, then they can give you signs of cough, if a patient is having other illnesses that show chest pain, then you can have chest pains. Then sputum production because of the secretion that are coming out from the illnesses. Fever, if it's due to infection and these infections are producing the secretions that are now going ahead to block our airways, then you start seeing fever out of it. Respiratory distress. A good indicator is the anesthetic effect. So if someone is on anesthesia and they... Maybe they've been overdosed in this case. So one of the side effects will be respiratory distress. Dyspnea, which is uh, difficult in breathing or sh showing signs of shallow breath or irregular breathing patterns and so on. Then we can have dyspnea in this case. Tachycardia. So with tachycardia, we mean increase in heart rate. So now when you have tachycardia state, uh, it's, a, it's a response of our heart in response to the lack of oxygen in the body. So when you're not breathing in enough air because of atelectasis, your blood will lack or the blood will lack enough oxygen. So what happened is your heart has to compensate. So it will start to contract very fast to try and pump as much blood as possible in the name of supplying enough oxygen. So as a result, we end up having tachycardia. Then you have tachypnea, which is increased in breathing rate. So with tachypnea, the breathing rate goes up because you want to really try and compensate for this alveoli that have collapsed and you want to meet the demands of your body in terms of the amount of oxygen needed. And then central cyanosis, this is an indicator of lack of um, oxygen or saturation in the blood. And as a result, you will see signs of cyanosis, cyanosis sorry, through the bluishness of our tongue, you can also see the bluishness existing on our uh, on our lips. In some cases, you can also start seeing bluishness under our nail beds and so on. But this is an indicator that there is lack of enough oxygen in our blood. So it tells you that if the minute you start seeing cyanosis, then the state is becoming chronic, and you need to start seeing ways of how to 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 replace the oxygen. So diagnosis or which methods can we use to check out the presentation of atelectasis? Number one indicator is physical examination. And here we are looking at decrease in breath sounds. Remember when the alveoli collapse, these are the areas where we listen for our breath sounds using the stereoscope. So when they have been collapsed or they have collapsed, then when you listen to the lung sounds at that particular area, you will not find sounds there. So you'll have decrease in breath sounds. In some cases, if the lung has been affected severely, then you'll find crackles over the affected areas. Pulse oximetry or checking on saturation of oxygen in the blood, the patient will present to us with a state we call hypoxia. So hypoxia, it's low uh, saturation of oxygen in our blood. And when you use our SpO2 machine or our pulse SpO2 machine, then you'll find values less than 19. And then with imaging processes or diagnosis, you can check chest X-rays, the CT scans, and also the bronchoscopy. 
So with chest X-ray, it will show you how the lungs are distributed, the size, you know, the reduction, is it reduced or is there any changes happening around it? And then the CT scan will give you a detailed analysis of how each and every tissue area around our lung area is getting affected by that electrosis pathophysiology. And bronchoscopy, it's a good one because here you can directly access the airways and evaluate exactly how the damage is happening. So with bronchoscopy, you can identify even the spot where that electrosis is happening or having a huge effect on. How do we manage? Management again is also based on what is causing a telectasis. So in this case, if the position is the one causing all this, maybe the client is on frequent superimposition, then you'll have to do frequent turning. So maintaining a turning chart and turning is good because it will mobilize secretion. So if a patient is on supine, then you can go ahead and turn them on, on, on our folders and change the position adequately so that you can mobilize secretions and allow the patient to cough them out. And then you can go for frequent sanctioning. So if you feel there is uh, excess secretions into the respiratory system, you can go ahead, sanction the patient, remove the excess or nebulize our client so that they can open up the airways. Welcome the physiotherapy in this case to participate in what we call postural drainage. So they will do chest exercises for our client and, and promote this postural drainage to get rid of any excess uh, secretion, you know, to remove any form of thick mucus that are stuck into the system. So the physiotherapists are very nice into doing this because they promote all these secretions to come out. And then you need to encourage deep breathing maneuvers at least every two hours encourage the patient to do deep breath exercises this is to help in increasing lung expansion you know to allow even the airways that have collapsed to open up and to allow that they are practicing as much as possible to take in as much air as possible into the system this will allow the airways to open up but it will minimize on any further airway closure or collapse that could have happened and if the state is very severe and there is no potential improvement then we can go for mechanical ventilation by either doing intubation or putting them on CPAP machines to encourage all this saturation to come up. Bronchodilators as a class of medication that we can use. Bronchodilators are known for assisting in dilating our airways and making the diameter huge or wider so that we can allow more air to go into the system and occupy our alveolus to open up. Finally, treat any underlying disease if it is an infection treat the infection to minimize on any secretions that are blocking the airways if it is a tumor go ahead and remove the tumor so that we can have the space release to avoid any compression against our tissues thank you so much for staying with us to the end if you enjoy our content remember to like this channel click on our subscription button there and click on the notification button so that you can get notified when we post our next class. Thank you so much and bye-bye.